Hello and welcome to the Futurum Tech webcast in collaboration with Model 9. I'm joined by Eddie Chilienda. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Stephen. So, Eddie, we're here to talk a little bit about Model 9, still a relatively new name in the mainframe space. First off, let's position your role. What do you do for Model 9? And then we'll dive into what the company does. Yeah, sure. So, uh, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Model 9. I'm responsible for all, for all things, uh, kind of long-term strategy, whether it's go-to-market, uh, marketing strategy, partner strategy, or even our kind of our long-term technology uh, uh, outlook. Tell our watchers and listeners a little bit about Model 9. As I say, still a relatively new company in the mainframe space. I've been tracking you guys pretty closely over the last few years, but let's just spend some time unpacking Model 9. Just give us an overview. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, again, for a uh, software company in the mainframe market, we are indeed uh, still uh, fairly new when most other companies have been around for decades, right? We were founded in 2016 in, in Tel Aviv, Israel. Uh, now have offices uh, here in the U.S., uh, uh, still a large development uh, office in, in Tel Aviv, in Israel. Uh, yeah, so been around now for a couple of years and have seen fantastic growth uh, over the past couple of years. Well, I think f I've spent some time digging in and I think it's really interesting. You describe a little bit about that company and the growth and the sort of expansion. I, I, you touched on it, a lot of the people in the mainframe space and your competition or sort of vendors have been in this space for decades. But I think from, you've told me a really good story in the past about the development the amount of expertise you've got, coupling that with the ability to be nimble and agile. Maybe just unpack that for the yeah. listeners a little. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's a very good point. One of the things we're really proud of uh, at, at Model Line is our development team, our R&D team. You know, people are still relatively young for, for a mainframe, uh, for, for the mainframe world, but uh, everybody has two decades of really in-depth uh, ZUS uh, systems programming uh, application development expertise. So I think that's really uh, the foundation of uh, the great products that we have developed over the years. So that gives me a great segue. Let's dive straight in. Explain to us what Model 9 does. So on a most basic level, right, our, our secret sauce, our technology, is that we uh, provide a native op S3 compatible object storage interface to IBM mainframes running the ZUS operating system. So now you open up the mainframe to all the innovation that is happening both on-prem with object storage uh, vendors on-prem as well as in the cloud, uh, giving customers a lot of flexibility and choice when it comes to, uh, to storage technology. So that's a really good overview, Eddie. Tell us a little bit about what customers are doing in the use cases. Uh, I know there's various different ways you can use that technology stack, but what are the customers doing with the technology? Yeah, so, you know, with that core technology, we enable three use cases uh, or three products, right? The first one is what we call Model 9 Shield. Model 9 Shield is a third data copy solution that, uh, you know, customers can use to A, protect themselves from logical corruption, you know, things like a ransomware attack, or, you know, I mean, we've also seen application errors causing logical corruption of data, right? So a lot of customers these days want to have a third data copy that is air-gapped and immutable uh, and again, that can be on object storage on-prem or even in the cloud where we have even more separation. And are you seeing that more, the demand for that more and more? I mean, we understand the threat landscape right now. Is that, is that what's driving adoption there? Absolutely. Uh, so I, I think, first of all, the threat landscape is one of the drivers. I think we see now much more regulatory pressure, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for sure in the U.S., in Europe, uh, for uh, several industries where they now have to implement those kind of data vaults or, or third data uh, locations. Uh, so, yes, definitely a, a lot of traction in that space. And is that because the mainframes are typically deployed into highly regulated industries? We're talking banks, telcos, retailers, we're talking government institutions. Is that, is that really what's driving that adoption? You're spot on, right? And I think then the other reason why we're seeing so much traction on our side is that all the other technologies that uh, you know, achieve similar outcomes as it re uh, relates to air-gapped uh, immutable data copies, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty hardware intense, mm -hmm. so you need a lot of on-prem infrastructure to be able to replicate the same thing that we can do, again, with object storage, either on-premise or fully in the cloud, right? We have some customers, uh, actually a large financial services entity here in the U.S., uh, what they're now doing is they can recover their whole mainframe, you know, bare metal, recover their whole mainframe from uh, the data copy they've stored in the cloud. 
we have another co uh, customer in, in Europe that uh, is now creating, a, by, by the way, in the banking sector, it is now creating a data copy outside of the country because they're uh, concerned with a lot of the geopolitical tension. You know, they're closer to the border to, to Russia, so they uh, are now creating a data copy uh, in a cloud data center in Germany. So you mentioned the word immutable there. I think there's a lot in that word. Mm -hmm. So maybe just unpack what that means. Yeah. Uh, it means that once you have your data on object storage, again, whether it is on-premise or in a cloud, sorry to th sound like a broken record here, but once you have your data on object storage, the idea is uh, that nobody inside your organization or outside your, or your organization can tamper with that data anymore, right? So that in case you know everything uh, goes wrong and then your primary data copies are corrupted, your secondary data copies, which is usually you know your, your backup data is corrupted, you still have that one golden copy that you can recover your data, that you can recover your enterprise. From. The one source of the truth. Yeah. If everything else is sort of going exactly. wrong, you can go back to this one golden copy of data exactly. and you're good. Uh, I, I think that, and I mean, I asked you that question. It's kind of something, a phrase you probably say all the time, but I think that's absolutely crucial. And you know, what we see with the threat landscape as it is at the moment, hacking and sort of cyber ter terrorism, whether that's state actors or f for profit, it's really impacting the landscape. And some of the customers, I can imagine, get a lot of comfort from that technology and that approach. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, one other area of comfort, so to speak, is just how quickly they can protect themselves using our technology as opposed to you know, uh, some on-prem infrastructure uh, a solution where, you, again, you first need to evaluate the technology, then, then procure it, get it into the data center, get it set up. You know, we're talking weeks, months, uh, very likely to implement such a protection architecture, whereas here we have seen customers go live within weeks. I think that's a key point. I'm glad you brought it up. I mean, that those threats are over here and now problem. They're not a three or four, five, six Spot month on, yeah. from now problem. They're a today problem. So I hadn't realized that that was one of the key differentiators. So that was the first technology and sort of key sort of solution area. Maybe talk to me about the next as we go through the portfolio. Yeah, no, absolutely. Here. Absolutely. So, so the second uh, solution that we have is what we call model line manager. And model line manager kind of takes the, the shield concept to the next level in that you now can use that same underlying technology, you know, our, our, our super fast, highly secure, low overhead transport to object storage, but now use that technology uh, to back up and restore your mainframe data, mm -hmm. right? So you can now replace your on-premise tape or virtual tape infrastructure, your current mainframe backup software with Model Line Manager and use object storage as a target, right? And we hear from a lot of, especially larger enterprises, that they want to that they want to simplify their architecture, not just in the mainframe environment, but across the organization and standardize on object storage. And we now allow to use the same object storage platform that you're using for your x86 uh, infrastructure, for a cloud infrastructure, now also for your mainframe. So is that a simplicity play? Is that a TCO play? Sort of maybe unpack what's yeah. driving that customer adoption. No, no, spot on. I think it's all of the above, right? So I mean, TCO, we usually see customers, you know, save some around 50% going to our solution versus kind of the, the incumbent uh, technologies that are out there. Uh, simplification, uh, very important. Again, you know, you standardize to, to one storage architecture, for both for mainframe and open systems. Uh, also, a simplification play from just kind of, um, you know, from a software perspective. I think our software, again, since we're a younger company, I think is, uh, has uh, far less uh, legacy in it. Uh, you know, it's easier to manage, and especially it's easier to manage for kind of the next generation of, of mainframe specialists, right? Something that I know that you and I both uh, uh, care a lot about. So it's a clearly simplification from that perspective. And is that collapsing the silos? You, you and I have worked in this space for a while. You've got the mainframe storage team. You've got the distributed storage team. You've probably now got a cloud storage team. Are you seeing this just a collapsing of those silos and now it's a storage team yeah. looking after storage? There's not that unique kind of mainframeness. Yeah. to storage, is that really what you're seeing? Absolutely, right, and we both know it's a bit of a journey, right, so oftentimes it's also kind of the, the biggest challenges that we have to overcome during one of our projects is just to get those uh, currently very siloed infrastructures play nicely together, mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, organizations can just gain so much 
by again by sim simplifying their stack, reducing their stack, uh, you know, the amount of vendors that they have in there. So I think there's uh, there's a great play there. And I see a lot with that. We've talked to a lot about it off camera around hybrid and that sort of desire to be able to not only leverage object storage on prem but also leverage object storage in the cloud. And that's a nice thing. You know, once you use object storage for any of the three use cases, by the way, that we enable. But once you use S3 compatible object storage, you know, it's now very easy for you as an organization to switch from one storage platform to the other, right? You can go first on-prem, which is something that we see frequently, right? People start on-prem because they still have some concerns about the cloud or, you know, they have some data sovereignty uh, issues going on. But once you have implemented our technology, you know, it's going to be very easy for you to either switch object storage platforms or go from on-prem to the cloud or implement the full hybrid model where you have some infrastructure on-prem again, perhaps for fast restore, and then leverage the cloud for, uh, for more archival type of data. And I think that's the type of flexibility that customers are looking for. That's certainly what I'm hearing when I engage with clients. We're, we're, they're looking for that flexibility. They want to be able to work with storage vendors on-prem. They want to have the flexibility to be able to switch out particular vendors, or ultimately they might want to explore the cloud. So that's the second area. Maybe go one more and go into that final use case for us. Yeah. No, absolutely. So again, the first two use cases were more in the data protection space, right? Model 9 Shield uh, for the third data copy, Model 9 Manager to replace backup, restore completely. Now our third product uh, or use case will be called Model 9 Gravity. Uh, takes those two use cases and adds a, a transformation of the mainframe data to open systems formats, right? Because with the first two use cases, we still move the mainframe data in its proprietary format, right? It's Big Endian, Epsidic, whatever you have, uh, so that we can recover exactly the same data from the cloud or from object storage. But the, the short fall of that is you, you're not able to use the data for anything other than uh, to restore it to the mainframe. And we have a lot of customers that say, hey, look, once I have the data in object storage, once I have the data in the cloud, I would like to do more with it. I like to feed my data lake. I would like to feed my cloud native applications. I would like to uh, perhaps inspect the data, right? If we talk about the Model 9 Shield use case, perhaps you want to do some cyber forensics in the cloud, so you need to be able to understand the mainframe data. And what Model 9 Gravity does is two things. First of all, uh, you can use it as a transport mechanism to move data very, very efficiently from the mainframe to the cloud, right? Think about moving petabytes to the cloud. FTP is not going to cut it. Mm -hmm. right, so we're very efficient, low overhead. Uh, we can move huge amounts of data, uh, of mainframe from data to the cloud, right? And so that's the first use case of model like gravity. And then once your data is landed in the cloud, you know, now we have an EC2 instance uh, for, uh, that can now be used to transform that proprietary mainframe data into any open systems formats, right? JSON, CSV, whatever you want to feed your data lake, your AI applications with. ETL in the mainframe space has always been a long, uh, an issue for clients. Are you really saying there that you're sort of collapsing down that overhead and maybe transferring that overhead from what used to be consuming mainframe MIPS and now doing it in a different way? Is that what I'm hearing? Absolutely, right? So I think we, we, we kind of take the ETL paradigm, right, the extract, transform, load paradigm, and turn it upside down. So we, we extract, we load, but then do the heavy transformation in the cloud where resources are usually more abundant and cheaper for organizations. So that's what, it's not consuming those mainframe MIPS to do that sort of transformation piece. You're able to do that off-prem in the cloud effectively. Exactly, and you know, I think ETL has been around now for decades. There's a gazillion ETL products out there. And ETL has absolutely has its, its place, right? But what we see more and more is that ETL reaches its, its limitations because it only moves small amounts of, uh, records, small amounts of data uh, to uh, your target platform, right? If you just want to have some reference data, whatever it is, you know, bank account information, customer information, that is fine. But think about, you know, some of the large mainframe shops that have, you know, perhaps petabytes, you know, decades of historical data that they now want to feed into an AI or machine learning environment uh, to, to find new insights then ETL has its limitations, right? Whereas, again, we at Model 9, because we have those other two use cases, Shield and Manager, where we're already used to move petabytes of data efficiently to the cloud, you can now use that same technology 
and move data, again, very, very efficiently, securely, low overhead to the cloud and then do the transformation out there in the cloud. So we've covered a lot of ground, Eddie. We've gone through the entire Model 9 portfolio. How would you summarize that up for, the, for your sort of potential clients as they're looking to explore Model 9 and find out more? Yeah, I think the important thing to know with Model 9 is we have a very modular architecture. So you can start at any entry point, whatever you know, makes most sense for your organization. We had customers that, we, that started with cyber resiliency, uh, with the Shield product, and then went full manager. We had customers that started with manager and replaced their uh, on-prem backup uh, environment and then went to Gravity because now you know, they wanted to get more insights out of, the, uh, the, uh, out of their data. So I think the flexibility of our portfolio, I think, makes it very easy for customers to, to choose the starting point that is best for them, that uh, aligns best with their organization's priorities. So as customers look to start their journey, where would you suggest they go first to find out more about Model 9? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that the best place to start is always uh, visit us at model9.io. We now have a content, man content management platform on our website where customers or uh, prospective customers can log in and learn much more about uh, our, our technology and even set up uh, you know, custom briefings, custom demos if they really want to dig, uh, dig deeper. Fantastic. You've been watching the Futurum Tech webcast. Please check out the rest of our shows. Thank you very much for listening.